That was a great blessing you ended with. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. To win a Nobel Prize or a Turing Award or a Fields Medal is a once-in-a-lifetime event for the winner. But, but for the field or for the community, it is not. Nobel Prizes and Turing Awards are awarded annually in their respected fields and disciplines. And the Fields Medal, I think, every four years. Dan David Prizes are awarded annually, but in different and non-rotating disciplines. It is awarded in the past category to the history of science this year, and is hence a once-in-a-lifetime occasion for celebration, not only for the three Dear winners, Rainey, Evelyn, and Simon, and I'll, I think Leo explained the first name basis, and I'll have something to say about that in a minute, um, but also to the field of history of science at large. This is a once-in-a-lifetime event. But it is more than that. Stockholm and Oslo boast economists and physicists and chemists and medical doctors and writers and peace activists. But the gathering of Nobel laureates there each year remains a remote and a formal affair, lacking most often of collegial intimacy. And the same goes for most of the Dan David Prizes awarded each year to stellar contributors to fields and disciplines represented in Israel, in, in Israeli academe, but to which the winners not always have personal connection. History of science is a very different story, and Leo touched about that. Israel in general, and Tel Aviv University in particular, boast, have boasted now for decades a thriving HPS community whose members are, ke uh, uh, are centrally involved and are major contributors at almost every front line of the discipline. Evelyn Rainey and Simon are close colleagues who have had close personal relations, uh, uh, relationships with many of us and close institutional ties with the HPS centers at Tel Aviv, Hebrew U, Bar Ilan, Ben Gurion, and Haifa. And in Evelyn's case, and I, as I can bear personal witness to the Weizmann Institute as well. But they were not chosen by the prize committee, and I can attest to that too, because of their ties to Israel, not at all. They were chosen for their lifelong cutting-edge contributions to and formative impact on the, fields, uh, the field of history of science worldwide. Nor are their ties to Israel a mere happy coincidence because of Israel's long-time uh, uh, standing and voice in the field of HPS. It is inevitable that whoever won the Dan David Prize this year would of necessity almost not only be a leading light in the discipline, but a close colleague and a friend. And so this is a uniquely threefold celebration, a celebration of the sterling achievements of Evelyn Rainey and Simon and the richly deserved Dan David Prize. They were award, awarded on Sunday evening, and, and Leo and I were at the ceremony, which was a very, very moving uh, um, uh, uh, event. And, and, but it's also a unique cause for celebration for the entire history of science community worldwide and a special cause for rejoicing in their achievement for the Israeli history of science community and especially that of the Kern Institute at Tel Aviv. And that is before saying anything about what each of the three Dan David laureates have come to stand for in the field. I shall have more to say about their work in the afternoon symposium, at this point suffice it to say that if history of science is dedicated to historicizing science, to dispelling common myths regarding the seemingly certainty, fixedness, universality, time and cultural independence, absolute object objectivity of, of the scientific enterprise, its rationality and its seemingly solid factual basis, then one could crudely describe our three laureates' lifelong contributions to the field in terms of an interesting carving up of the territory, 
okay, with, with Evelyn Fox Keller, in addition to a pioneering work on gender in science, directing much of her work to, to historicizing the science's very vocabulary, especially in, 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 in the life sciences. Simon Schaffer, its very practices, theoretical uh, and experimental, and Rainey Daston, its very second order normative vocabulary, uh, rationality, objectivity, and so on and so forth. And I shall have, as I said, a little more to say about this later today uh, at the event which is dedicated to their contributions. But we decided to kick off this uh, festive event uh, and take advantage of the wonderful, uh, unique opportunity of hosting the three of you here together to muse first a little about where the field of history of science stands today from your different perspectives, what new challenges it poses, what new opportunities it gives rise to, which roads were not taken, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Rainy Evelyn and Simon will each speak briefly and in this order, after which they will open the floor for discussion. So first then to Rainy Daston, who will speak about what isn't the history of knowledge. Rainy, please. Menachem, thank you um, for all of your hospitality, so characteristic, both intellectual and creaturely. Thank all of you for coming. Um, if the Dan David Foundation decided to honor the tiny discipline of the history of science as its category for the past this year, surely it has to do not only with universal principles of excellence, but with the local scintillation of the history and philosophy of science here at the University of Tel Aviv. We bask in your reflected glory. Um, and I'd also like to take this moment to just say a word about how honored I feel to be in the presence of my fellow laureates, Evelyn and Simon. Evelyn, I thank for the boldness and conceptual clarity of her work, and more personally, for her model of moral and political and intellectual courage, which was really important to women of my generation. And Simon for doing the impossible. Um, Simon, in his mixture of analytical incisiveness with rich historical texture, has made the history of science interesting again. Um, if people no longer run fl flying, you know, screaming from the room when you say you're a historian of science, it's all due to, his, to Simon. So thank you, both of you. And finally, to Leo, thank you for the blessings. I'm going to need them. I'm about to undertake the most perilous task of any historian. I am about to try to say something about the future. I'm going to try and dodge this by not so much predicting the future as to express my hopes. I'm going to do so by talking about a field which is perhaps more present in the minds of people who are not in the Anglophone world, um, namely the history of knowledge. We had, a, our, Menachem alluded to our breakfast time conversation um, about the various cognates for knowledge and science and the humanities um, in various languages. Um, I live most of my life these days in a Germanophone world um, in which the German word Wissenschaft cognate with the Latin scientia never narrowed its scope to pertain only to the natural sciences. In my corner of the world in Berlin, it is still possible to talk about Literaturwissenschaft, the science of literature, without a smile on your face and without imagining um, scholars in white coats throwing classical books into the centrifuge. Um, it, it's also the fact that although our institute is a small one for the tiny discipline of the history of science, it's also an international one. And the presence of scholars from all over the world has put very welcome pressure on me and my colleagues to start thinking about the provincialism of our own categories. So I'd like to talk about 
the ways in which the new and expansive discipline of the history of knowledge is attempting to deprovincialize the history of science. The history of knowledge is at once the creation of and a contradiction to the discipline of the history of science. And in order to understand how this paradoxical situation came about, I'm going to have to give you a very short sketch of how the discipline of the history of science came into being. And I'm also then going to turn to um, the history of knowledge and its current predicament. Um, very briefly, my argument is going to be that the boundaries, or rather the lack of boundaries, of the history of knowledge are defined by contradistinction to the history of science. And like all definitions defined um, by contradistinction, um, that has made um, it a loose and baggy field. It lacks coherence. And my hope is that the kind of um, analytical pressure that has made the history of science so distinctive amongst other branches of history. It is by far the most theorized branch of history, thanks to our constant interaction, sometimes fractious, with philosophers, sociologists, um, and anthropologists. My hope is that that kind of analytical pressure that has produced, I think, really quite remarkable results when it's been applied to science can now be applied to the nebulous concept of knowledge. And now I will need Leo's blessings because I've got to get out of this PowerPoint and into another one on a computer, which is not my own. Let's plus escape. Yes, escape. A wonderful, yes, OK. Um, OK, OK, right, exactly, right, exactly. Hey, that's it. That's me. That's me. Okay. Where's this little insignia? There it is over there. Okay, right. Great. Thank you, Leo. Um, okay. So, once upon a time, but not so long ago, um, say circa 1980 when I was in graduate school, um, the mental map of most historians of science looked like this. Um, you would have, if you were a specialist in the period of the scientific revolution, which at that time um, was still the center of gravity of the discipline, then your mental map, my mental map, would have been even more circumscribed. Um, it would have been not even the whole of Western Europe, but just a few urban centers, um, university towns, maybe seats of princely patrons, Padua, Cambridge, London, Paris, Amsterdam, but nowhere east of Kepler's Prague, or north of Tycho's island of Havane, um, or south of Rome, or west of London. Um, not only whole continents, Asia, the Americas, Africa, but the entire Iberian Peninsula, Russia, the Ottoman Empire, would have been shrouded in the mists of presumed insignificance. Just to give you a sense of how crazy this is by the standards of general history. So here are the political units of you know, circa 1650, and what should immediately strike your eye is the um, centrality of the Ottoman Empire, the Russian Empire, and of course the Portuguese and Spanish empires, all, all entities completely off the mental map of historians of science circa 1980. Um, and your chronology would have been equally fixated on the period of the scientific revolution. So um, I know this is difficult to read. This is the his timeline of the history of science. I just want to show you, direct your attention to um, the far left. And this is the tiny part which is dedicated to science, pre-modern science, um, before, as you see in the lower right-hand corner, before um, Galileo. Um, 
or in my very favorite um, chronology of the history of science, which represents the history of science as the London Tube map, um, it's very, it's really cleverly designed so that the longer outer lines with the most stops are the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, it's the center, which is pre-modern science. I'll return with a close-up um, in a moment to that. Now, it's all all maps and all chronologies are provincial. You'll, you'll know some famous examples of this. Um, there's the Saul Steinberg, the famous New Yorker cover of 1976, The View from Ninth Avenue, in which you see in the distance, Jersey, and way in the distance, Japan, China, and Russia. Or my favorite timeline of all time, which is the um, timeline of Languedoc in France, in which nothing of note happens between 1666, when the Canal du Midi begins, and 1875, when um, phylloxera, um, an insect, destroys the vineyards. Nothing, nothing happens. The French Revolution, nothing. Um, now, as I say, um, this this is this is a standard fare for all chronologies and all all maps. But um, I'd like to focus on a, a rather different problem about the disciplinary neurosis of the history of science. Um, this narrative of 16th and 17th century European science uh, as the origin of the modern world has the effect of um, conflating a wildly asymmetric geography, that handful of European cities versus the rest of the world, um, so um, with, a, um, equally, with an equally um, asymmetric timeline, um, the modern era versus all the rest of the world's history. Um, this conflation of the Western past with everybody else is present um, has reverberated well beyond the confines of the academic discipline of the history of science. I won't say very much about um, how this narrative came into be. Many of you will recognize the titles that conjured the discipline of the history of science into existence. Um, Alfred North Whitehead's Science and the Modern World, or Herbert Butterfield's The Origin of Modern Science. There's a whole clutch of books that are published between about 1920 and 1960, all of which have something like modern and science in the title that establish the narrative, which was quite new at the time that science was the motor of capital M modernity. And in the words of Whitehead, the birthplace of science is Europe. Its home is in the whole world. Wherever science spread, and here Whitehead mentions explicitly um, the Asian civilizations, he's thinking especially of Japan, um, modernity follows in its wake. So if we return to that wildly asymmetric geography, and we also return to the pre-modern part of um, the subway map, the London tube map, um, you'll notice here, so here we are in, at the very center is pre-modern science. And um, you'll notice that the lines are color coded. So the, the dark blue line, which I guess it corresponds to the Piccadilly line, Simon, is that the Piccadilly line? Right, that's mathematics. So you see all of the stops. And you see wonderfully that Isaac Newton is um, the junction of the natural philosophy, the mathematics, and the discontinued alchemy line. That's the dotted, the, the, the dotted brown line. Um, so this, this, you know, these kinds of um, these kinds of provincialism can, especially if they're self-ironizing like this one is, they can be charming. But there's nothing ironic and there's nothing charming about the chronology and the geography which created the discipline of the history of science um, in between the two world wars. Um, let me return us to that world very briefly, um, to the world of, for example, United States Cold War foreign policy. The year is around 1960. It's about the same time that area studies programs are being created at um, US universities with money from the Ford Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, um, and the, of course the US government overtly from the National Defense Education Act of 1957 in the wake of Sputnik and covertly from the CIA and the FBI. 
Um, so these regions are not regions that necessarily have historical or cultural integrity. They're ones with current geopolitical significance. South Asian studies is born at this moment. Middle Eastern studies is born at this moment as a, a region of study. Um, the name is Walt Whitman Rostow, um, an economist at MIT, uh, who has just published a book um, it is going to make him famous and is going to dominate U.S. development policy for decades to come. He's an advisor to presidents from John F. Kennedy to Ronald Reagan. Um, it also is going to dominate social science modernization theories. It's called The Stages of Economic Growth, and it's pointedly subtitled um, A Non-Communist Manifesto. Here you see Mr. Rostow. Um, he's the guy, the owlish looking guy with the glasses here on the far right. Um, showing Lyndon, President, then President Lyndon Johnson, um, the Khaesan area in South Vietnam, which is about to be bombed by US forces. Um, this non communist manifesto begins with a chart of the stages of economic growth in selected countries, and you can see that it's basically understanding modernization as a race. Some countries, Britain notably, are in the van um, at the very top there, and others like India and China at the bottom have barely gotten out of um, the starting block. Um, what Rostow's message is, this is a book, this is a book about economic modernization, um, but his message is that all of the countries in the present and in the world's history can be divided not into industrial and pre-industrial nations, but rather into um, Newtonian and pre-Newtonian societies. Um, in terms of history then, with the phrase traditional society, we are grouping the whole pre-Newtonian world. The dynasties of China, the civilization of the Middle East, and the Mediterranean, and the world of medieval Europe. Now this isn't the first time that everybody else's present has been conflated with the European past. There are traces, for example, in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations um, of exactly this sort. Um, but this particular conflation is highly consequential. Not only does it come at the geopolitical moment of Cold War maneuvering for the allegiances of newly decolonized nations, the moment that created all of these new academic departments of area studies, um, which def are defined through the lens of current political significance rather than through that of language, history, culture, or geography. It's also the formative moment for the discipline of the history of science, propelled by many of the same geopolitical forces. Um, this wave of institutionalization, the creation of programs, um, f first um, um, chairs here and there, then real programs, um, at departments um, in the United States, in Great Britain, and in some parts of Europe, and then, of course, in Israel, um, is propelled by the doctrine that science created the modern world and with it Western global dominance so that anyone who wants to understand how modernity came about and how to deal with it must therefore understand the history of science. And this message became screamingly urgent at latest with the detonation of bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945. And it is no coincidence that the moving spirit behind one of the largest of these new departments of the history of science, that at Harvard, was um, James Bryant Conant, president of Harvard and one of the chief administrators of the Manhattan Project. Here you see Conant. He is seated at the center there. He is flanked by, on his right, George Marshall, who is about to deliver the Marshall Address, the plan, the Marshall Plan. On his left is General Omar Bradley, military head of the Atomic Bomb Project. At the far right here is Robert Oppenheimer. And looking somewhat bemused, here wearing academic regalia, um, is T.S. Eliot, who also happened to get an honorary degree at the commencement, the Harvard commencement of 1947. 
So this is how the history of science, at least in its originary moment, became a discipline. And not just a Eurocentric narrative, but the Eurocentric narrative. The narrative about how the West diverged from the rest. By singularizing the scientific revolution as a world historical event that happened only once and only in Europe, this narrative created a vast salon des refusés, all the ways of knowing that were not included in the current anglophone and francophone definition of science. Now, this is a very large and motley crew. Um, imagine for a moment the scholastic philosophers of 13th century Paris, the gardeners of 16th century Istanbul, the Chinese scholars of the Ming Dynasty, the court astronomers of Samarkand, Sanskrit grammarians, herbalists and healers of Peru, architects of Jaipur and Florence, um, lace makers in Austrian villages, and humanists almost everywhere at any time. Now, those of you who know something about the etymology of the word science will know that it narrows its meaning to mean only the natural sciences in English, only in the mid 19th century and in other languages significantly later, and in some languages never, as in German, for example, the German um, Wissenschaft, um, which is the umbrella term for systematized knowledge about any subject cognate with the Latin scientia. To say nothing of languages that are not in the European family or from other epochs. And it's only in the mid 20th century that this narrow construal of science becomes the heart of a theory of modernization, which is, I must say, contrary to all of the evidence, projected backwards to the 16th and 17th centuries, and is conceived of, as in that Rostow chart, as a race among nations, a kind of Olympics of civilization. The consequence was that all forms of knowledge that did not fit into the straightened category of modern Anglophone science, regardless of when and by whom and how pursued, were thrown into the wastebasket category of the history of knowledge. This is a phantasmagoric amalgam of the pre-modern European, non-Western, practical and humanistic that even Borges could not have dreamed up. It's as if you had divided the universe asymmetrically between a privileged class, let us make beavers the privileged class, beavers, and non-beavers, everything else. Um, and you should imagine the Salon des Refusés as a kind of I must say, a kind of wonderful cocktail party. Um, I, I imagine Aristotle is chatting with a Chinese bureaucrat from the Qing. Um, a Renaissance Florentine stonecutter has gone to freshen the drink of a Sanskrit pandit. Um, a professor of theology um, at the medieval University of Paris is going on and on and on about omniscience and omnipotence to the master of the hunt at a 10th century Central Asian court. And um, a, an astronomer from um, 14th century Baghdad is trying to disentangle himself from a conversation with a classics professor at the University of Tel Aviv. Um, it, it all sounds very jolly. Um, but coherent, it's not. Um, and yet, the originary narrative of the history of science still shapes, or rather distorts, the history of knowledge in ways that constrict its range and muddy its focus. Um, in the case of the history of pre-modern European topics, um, even the most audacious studies have tethered their explorations of the origins of experiment, or courtly patronage, or indigenous herbalism, or alchemy, to the great names 
in the history of science pantheon to Isaac Newton, to Linnaeus, um, to Robert Boyle, to Galileo. And although these studies are anything, anything but hagiographic, they derive their credentials as bona fide history of science by invoking the names of the beatified saints of the discipline. Historians of the humanities, for their part, are particularly keen to point out those few cases in which um, the scientists borrow from the humanists. For example, um, Darwin's branching tree diagram in the origin from the tree diagrams of the historical philologists. And analogously, in the case of studies of non-Western knowledge, the very best of these, and these are very good indeed, are those of encounters between um, Western science and, and other cultures, so the Latin American or the Chinese artists who identify exotic plants for European botanists, um, the Indian pandits who help European philologists make sense of Sanskrit, um, the Jesuits and other European astronomers who incorporate the observations of ancient India and China into the astronomical canon, and the herbalists and the merchants who taught European doctors and also European cooks the properties of drugs and comestibles from Chichono Bark to combat malaria to persimmons to combat native British cuisine. This is, as I say, work of the highest quality, and it's expanded the geography and the chronology and the dramatist personae of the history of science in mind-stretching ways. But one looks largely in vain, at least in European languages, for recent publications of comparable quality about the history of science or the history of knowledge in South or East Asia on pre-20th century topics. And this is unfortunately a vacuum into which chauvinistic studies claiming to find general relativity in the Vedas or the calculus in Confucius rush. When Narendra Modi, Prime Minister of India, gives speeches in which he claims that the Hindu gods flew between planets in planes, or that cosmetic surgery was practiced in ancient India, um, how else could you get the head of an elephant onto a human body, he says, um, he's inadvertently paying tribute to the very Western standards that he, as a Hindu nationalist, professes to disdain. Um, the spout, despite their avowed hostility to Eurocentric Western narratives about the rise of modern science, these nationalist works pay it implicit tribute. Rarely are the, the achievements of modern science challenged. The only question is who got there first. So Rostow's chart of modernization as a race between the pre-Newtonian and the Newtonian civilizations still shapes geopolitics in strange ways. So let me summarize. The best and the worst historical work on the large Salon des Refusés of the History of Knowledge cast out by scientific modernity um, is a definition of the history of knowledge by contradistinction as everything that is not modern Western science. As a result, the history of knowledge is a hodgepodge, a really interesting, amusing, entertaining, um, and um, you know, full of bright possibilities as a hodgepodge, but it's also strangely restricted. Rarer than rubies are studies in the history of knowledge that do not explicitly or implicitly justify their topics by somehow attaching themselves to the history of science. So my question is, can we imagine a history of knowledge that would be freestanding? I think the challenges are formidable, and I'll just review them. They're pretty obvious, but I'll, I'll just enumerate them so that we keep them in mind. First of all, whose knowledge counts and why? So even if we shift, as we historians are wont to do, um, the responsibility for defining subject matter to the historical actors themselves, the problem is not going to be solved. Um, in many epochs and many cultures, for example, practical knowledge, especially that of low status groups, like um, handy workers or peasants or servants or women is often not recognized, either semantically or socially as genuine knowledge. Should we historians follow suit? Second, knowledge by whomever 
um, defined is never a static category. It's always mutating in response to both internal and external pressures. So, um, for example, um, one thinks about how Renaissance European courts cultivated forms of knowledge such as engineering and alchemy that were marginalized by the universities. Um, gardeners of many lands had to learn to cultivate exotic plants such as potatoes and tulips in new soils and climates. Here you see not accidentally called the Jardin du Roi um, at, in Paris um, established in the 17th century. Chinese emperors employed first Islamic and then Jesuit astronomers as the most expert in their field, but expert in different ways. Commodities such as porcelain and indigo dyed cloth inspired imitators who invented new techniques and products. Surely a history of knowledge should also attend to the dynamics of the category as well as to the diversity of definitions in any given cultural and historical context. So the take home message is historicism alone is not going to sort out the miscellany. So even after we've observed the usual historical strictures against anachronism, we're still left with the question, what is the history of knowledge about? Or perhaps more pointedly, what isn't it about? Um, this is, I think, a really uncomfortable question for the burgeoning new field of the history of knowledge because a lot of its appeal has rested on its come one, come all embrace. In contrast to the history of science, which has been traditionally snobbish, we've been preoccupied with um, what now seem to be archaic debates about the demarcation criterion between science and um, pseudoscience or between modern and pre-modern, um, um, the history of knowledge has rolled out the, malcom the welcome mat to everybody. I mean, it's, um, as I say, the lace makers in the Austrian village, the humanists, the courtiers, the office workers, the bureaucrats, the animal keepers, the merchants, come one, come all. Um, these laudable aspirations have also been reinforced by the hope of creating a genuinely global history of knowledge. It sharpens the double challenge to define subject matter and context. Um, it's a platitude to say that different cultures at different times understand knowledge in different ways, but also the circulation of people, ideas, and things over oceans, continents, and millennia raises questions about the analytical units which are our stock and trade, namely what is a historical period? What is a cultural unit? Um, do they have really any traction in analyzing, for example, how knowledge of silk manufacture spreads from China to Northern Italy um, or telescopic astronomy in the reverse direction? So to repeat, this time with oomph, the question, what is not the history of knowledge? So let me end with a, a few very tentative thoughts about how we might give this fuzzy, woolly category um, sharper contours, and that we is meant really emphatically. This can only be a collective work of scholars knowing many languages and expert in many cultures and epochs. Just as there's no culture without knowledge, um, there's no culture without at least an implicit systematics of knowledge, starting with an epistemological hierarchy, which is very often intertwined with a social hierarchy. So there are kinds of knowledge which are more or less valued, and there's a rationale about who can practice them and why. These hierarchies also rank knowers and the epistemic virtues they're expected to display. So even without the existence of epistemic cultures which are self-consciously dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge, um, such hierarchies do exist. So let me just give an example, simply because it's one that will be familiar to most historians of science, which is the Renaissance court, like this one, beautiful picture by Mantegna of the court at Mantua. Um, the courts are not epistemic cultures. They are not, they do not exist to pursue knowledge, but they nonetheless put pressure on 
the systematics of knowledge represented by the more official communities of learning. So, for example, they prize practical efficacy um, above causal explanation. They are much more interested in the particulars about the properties of plants or, or curing waters over universal generalizations. Um, in terms of exposition, they prize elegance over erudition. By offering plummy patronage jobs to talented men on the make and also a few women on the make, the courts succeeded in shifting the criteria and thereby reshuffling the hierarchy with remarkable results. So court physicians in the 16th century begin collecting and comparing observations of individual cases. Naturalists studied the exotica and exceptions on display in princely Wunderkammern. Mathematicians turned to problems of engineering. Philosophers probed the secrets of alchemy, which is the court science par excellence. Viewed from a more philosophical standpoint, these are shifts in the ideals and practices that create new epistemic values as well as new knowledge. Um, it places a premium on prediction, not explanation, but prediction of particular effects, which had been a quite lowly value associated with natural divination before about the 16th century. It merges explanation with universal causes and experiment and observation. Experimentum and observatio are two words rarely conjoined in a medieval Latin text. Um, the stock of hands-on knowledge shoots up and that of metaphysics plummets. The pursuit of knowledge becomes collective, not only amongst the naturalists, but also amongst the humanists. These are enormous changes in the systematics of knowledge. I just adduce this because it's one well-studied case example of um, the dynamism of knowledge systems um, under pressure from both within and without. I can only allude very briefly to the very interesting um, literature which likens the circulation of knowledge to that of commodities among cultures. And I, I think that this has proved very revealing. One thinks, for example, about the way in which um, a commodity like chinchona bark as an antidote to certain fevers, malarial fevers, um, circulated um, from Peru to Europe and, and beyond. Um, but I don't think it's going to explain everything. It's not a puzzle to explain how pharmaceuticals, how drugs and spices spread. Um, they're, they're, they're easily consumed. It's a lot harder to explain, or Ming, or Ming Dynasty porcelain also. Once you've seen it, you have to have it. Um, it's a lot harder to explain how knowledge of Sanskrit or for that matter, a um, an, an very technical astronomical text spreads amongst cultures, but it does. And that is a challenge um, flung down to all of us. Um, the hope is that perhaps these kinds of studies, as I say once again, pursued by a collective, might be able to yield certain generalizations which span epochs and cultures. That is, they might challenge historians to think in different ways about contexts and which kinds of contexts are relevant. Um, I'll just mention one example, which is there are quite a number of cultures, not all cultures, but quite a number of cultures for which philology is the queen of the sciences. It is philology, it is grammar, which is the source of the most ironclad regularities. So ironclad that even the exceptions are classified. Um, these are, so I'm thinking of the traditions of India, of China, of the Mediterranean basin, um, the languages of classical Chinese, of Sanskrit, of Hebrew, of Arabic, of Persian, of Greek and, and Latin. Um, we know very little about the mechanisms that refresh these old texts for new audiences, starting with that fountain of youth, the much abused but very little studied genre of the commentary. 
um, the analogs or affinities that smoothly slot imported knowledge into extant knowledge systems are multiple, and some of them might also be um, more sociological. I think, for example, of the striking prevalence of the disputation of intellectual discourse staged as an agonistic duel, how prevalent this is in many, many cultures. Not in all, perhaps, but in a striking number of them. And I hardly need say that most of our intellectual life is conducted as a polemic. Um, what scholarly or scientific article does not begin with X in her recent article has claimed Y. This article is going to refute X and claim Z. Um, the disputation is still very much with us. The variety and dynamism of knowledge systems is well adapted to historicist and global approaches. The hierarchies and interactions among their parts and practitioners justify, I think at least, the name of systems. Such systems are rarely close, they're never static, and their omissions, what cannot be an object of knowledge at a particular place and time, are as revealing as what is included. They cut the channels into which curiosity flows, and I hope our curiosity will flow in that direction. Thanks so much. <laughs>